welcome back once again to the CHGO Sky podcast presented by CD1 Price Cleaners. Please, 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 please use CD1 Price for all of your cleaning needs, whether that's sending in your laundry, whether that's getting your clothes dry clean, and use that code CD, visit chgo.cd1, that's O-N-E dot com. And once you're there, you can pick from an in-store coupon or online pickup and delivery coupon options. So thank you to CD1 Price Cleaners for sponsoring the show. Thank you to whoever taught me how to speak for, you know, I'll, I'll get that right. Anyway, it's Chris Pennant here with Stephen Garner. Stephen Garner, the man, the X's and O's, every single bit of basketball knowledge that you could possibly consume. He's been holding it down for the last couple of months for y'all, and he will continue to hold it down as long as he stays with us. Stephen, how you doing, man? Man, I'm doing great, my guy. It's glad I'm I'm glad, and I'm sure the people that are either listening or podcast or watching are going to be glad to see you back up here with me too, man. So it's very, very refreshing. I'll say that. I appreciate it. And seriously, I, I, you know, not to make it a love fest right off the bat, but I appreciate everything that you've done and that you would continue to do for the show. We got Super Sarah Victor on the wheels of steel holding it down for the man with the golden hands, Joey Spathis, who will be with us momentarily. Follow the show online on Twitter at CHGO underscore Sky. You can sign Steven at StateUS.3. I am at K-W-A-N-D-A-R-Y Kitten. That's at Quandary Kitten on Twitter or the artist formerly known as Twitter, Elon Musk's baby, formerly known as Twitter. (sighs) So um, it was a very uneventful, you know, inconsequential time while I was away, right, man? Nothing happened. Absolutely. Everything everything is as it was when you left. (laughs) Same way. (laughs) I'm still leading the team. Yep. Uh, (laughs) Still kind of figuring out whether Dana's going to be on the bench or not. Mm -hmm. All that, right? Mm -hmm. You still got Atlanta here with us. Courtney's still Um, here. You still got Ruthie. You know? (laughs) Rebecca's healthy. You know, we got we got all the stuff you could ask for. <laughs> if you could rank the events of the last mm, six weeks on with you know like top to bottom, honestly, as as bad as it is that they that they traded Ka, and I think there's not it's there's a value to be found there because you got back some decent pieces, Michaela Onyenwere, Breezy Turner and draft picks, which is what I know a lot of people have wanted for so long anyway. Losing Courtney and Atlanta to Minnesota is top for me because that is free agency, so you don't get anything back. And Sarah, I need you to clip this because I know all the other shows got the audio hits and we need some audio hits. So I just need you to clip me just like doing the the uh the, the William Shatner in Star Trek 2 right now just Minnesota <laughs> I need that every time something happens with the links I need that clip <laughs> yeah we we've had our fair share of conversations on Minnesota and just the level of respect competition wise that it's it's inevitable to have for them everything that Sean Reeve has established with that franchise over there and Unfortunately, by way of Courtney and Atlanta, we're going to see two more Sky pieces going over there and making some uh, high-level contributing efforts to everything that they got going on around Diamond Miller. and Obviously, even more so, Nafisa Collier being back healthy and back in her true basketball flow, tearing it up overseas per usual. And obviously, yeah. still from that energy, she's going to be bringing it back over here to the States for, uh, for W season this summer as well. No doubt. And I think the most telling thing is, as you had it both in uh, some comments on, that I'm sure you got from the media day, uh, as well as uh, Courtney and Atlanta both going on Mitchell Hansen's podcast. Big ups to Mitchell Hansen, great writer for uh, Canis Hoopus, uh, Minnesota Lynx, and Minnesota Timberwolves. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was able to get uh, some good, some. I mean, it's hard not to get good tape from Courtney Williams, but impossible. <laughs> Courtney's going to give you a quote, no matter what. such an excellent quote, and she's so, like, you can ask her about anything and not have to, like, step on eggshells, and she's just going to be a straight shooter to you. She's going to crack a joke a little bit to break the ice and the the seriousness that comes with it, but she's just such a, she she's one of the top four, top three athletes I've been able to have been in communication with in a professional sense, just because of how open she is and how free-flowing she is. She's special, man. 
<laughs> and that's a good point to bring up because we're, we're coming to, um, you know, some of the reasons why both of them wanted to play for Minnesota, not least of which was the chance to play together again. But um, we're going to lose that. We're going to lose those personalities, both for us as media members and for Sky fans and, and the rest of the, you know, the, even the new look Sky team is going to lose that personality. Courtney, we know what her personality was you know, long before she even stepped on the WNBA court for those who got the chance to see her in Central Florida. And now that she's developed into this role, it's it's like she's got it's like she's starting a new career as a point guard primarily, mm -hmm. where before she was combo shooting guard. But that leadership, the um, affability, the willingness to bring people together, uh, what she talked about last year in post games about giving herself grace, giving her teammates grace, it was fresh and it was something that Sky fans really needed after the dismantling of their championship squad. Yeah. And obviously you have to, in team building, it's not always solely about what a player brings to the court. There's the personality bit as far as how those pieces mesh together with the other pieces on the roster, including the coaching staff and obviously the front office, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you have to find ways to not necessarily plug the gaps because everybody brings something different to the table but to just have something new in that spot. And I think if you're losing somebody like Courtney and all of the personability and the energy and just the, just the free flowing nature that she brings to everything that she's involved with to have that kind of in the place, like I said, not directly, but just kind of something different there to have somebody like Teresa Weatherspoon as your coach. I don't think you can do a, a much a better job at all in terms of having something else that's might be a little bit more conducive to winning based off of the context of this team. But just having that presence and having it from the head coach, I think it's going to hit different. And I think kind of what we talked, what I talked about with her um, in their most recent media availability, uh, the team will certainly exude a lot of the personalities that she has. And they feel that the roster not necessarily to directly align with that. But obviously, that's an important piece. And she says she thinks that they did a great job in doing so. Um, and Jeff Pagliola said the same as well. They all felt like they fielded a roster that is going to be feisty and competitive. I have that type of personality that's going to be engaging, but also entertaining at the same time. And I think that's that's something good that at least Sky fans can hang their hat on because you know retooling, rebuilding, all those words have been thrown around. But this, there's no other way to, to talk about this year other than to call it a rebuilding year. Uh, but I, I want to go back just because you you mentioned Teresa Weatherspoon, and I think it's not surprising, so to so to speak, but just kind of sad really for me that we didn't get to see finisher and Courtney, you know, work, be able to work together because I think so much of their personalities would have meshed, you know, would have had that, that ability to really gel together and, and create something. Well, I know while saying that, that Courtney was kind of a long shot within mm -hmm. the terms of the roster construction and the salary cap because she, was on that one new deal and was, if not do the, she wasn't going to take the veterans minimum no matter what, but it was going to be, you know, 100,000 upwards of that. But when you add that to the fact that on Mitchell Hansen's podcast that uh, hitting the hardwood podcast that came out today, she said that as soon, pretty much as soon as teams could talk to free agents at 1201, her phone rang and Cheryl Reed was on the other end of the line. Like, we want you to come to Minnesota. Yeah. And they, I think a consistent theme between her and Elena was for uh, both of them just finding somewhere that, that actually like wanted them and being able to have that, that, that kind of connecting piece, like, okay, I want to be here, but they also want me. And for that to be what kind of drives the ultimate decision that's made from free agents, obviously having their decision, their pick of the litter, especially those two players with uh, the, the things that they can bring to the table, them ultimately choosing Minnesota and Minnesota also choosing them. I think it's important. Um, and, you know, we can go into all of the talks of facilities and amenities and all of the stuff that I've been emphasizing over the last maybe three or four podcasts and how that ultimately plays into the decisions that free agents are making. You add that with a well-established head coach like Cheryl Reeve and all the respect that comes with that, there's a standard there. 
Now, obviously, Teresa Witherspoon is in the process of building that with this Chicago Sky franchise, and the front office has to handle their job on their own end of, of the, the overarching goal with the team, independent of Teresa. But Minnesota is well-established, and they've been established for a handful of years. And we're starting to see the franchises that either are established or are in the process of it, and people can tangibly see those things come into, coming into fruition the gravity that comes with that. You're able to get free agents that might necessarily, they might choose your location over somewhere that might be more um, shiny or exotic, a place with brand new facilities or a place with a bigger market. They might choose your franchise off of the respect dynamic. And I think that's important when you're looking at where the sky are at the moment and where they're trying to get back to in terms of um, the the level of uh, respect and the, the optics that come with being an elite level franchise in terms of how it's ran. Yeah, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. Can we actually get that quote up from uh, Courtney Williams on what she said about the facilities with, with Minnesota? Because that was really telling. Um, as you can see, it's like you never hear about Minnesota's facilities and what they can offer, but y'all have been doing this for a minute now. They, the Lynx, have been doing this for a while. And that's something that we never heard about, um, at least, you know, I think where the news media was in covering, in terms of covering the WNBA when Maya Moore and uh, Rebecca Brunson were doing what they were doing in Minnesota with Lindsey Whalen and Cheryl Reeve. I think we heard about that, the team and that team identity and culture in that fashion, more than we heard about facilities, you know, more than we heard about amenities, more than we heard about cold tubs, hot tubs, lockers, trainers, uh, massage therapists, all of that. So, and I think that came from Courtney Williams too, because you figure if we're not hearing about it, that makes sense. But if that fraternity sorority of players aren't hearing about it, that's different because players talk. Players are in that that um, that collection of talent, that uh, group that knows what the game is like, who you have to deal with. And so they compete, but they're going to, you know, hey, this is going on over here, this is going on over there. So I was kind of surprised to see that, that she, you know, was like, they've been doing this for a while. I was, that really struck me. And so we've heard that when you talk about um, the Sky Free Agents, who they were going for, NECA talked about that. Skyler talked about that with Seattle. Um, mm -hmm. We all heard it from the Lynx last year with uh, Candace. We heard about it with the Liberty, with Courtney leaving. So I think we are firmly in that second era or third era, depending on how you want to look at it, of WNBA basketball, where the Skies Championship was probably like the last time we'll see players who are just going to go somewhere based off of can we win a championship. That workplace, you know, how are you choosing your job is also about the workplace. You know, it's the same reason like we, you and I apply for jobs. Like you look at how much you're getting paid, you look at what the benefits are, and you look at what the workplace culture, the environment is. You know, among other things, you know, and how long is your commute to work? Something else this guy have to be focused <laughs> on, too. Yep. And I think in alignment with everything that you were just talking about, you could add another um, maybe as important as any piece that's left, Kalia Copper. And her media availability uh, two weeks ago, first opportunity speaking as a member of the Phoenix Mercury. The hot word again, amenities, facilities. <laughs> came back up again, just naturally in conversation. And she was talking about, you know, just how impressive it is to have a facility that proximity wise, you know, traveling is not hard to get to, but also just the actually to have it tangible, to see that process actually being executed upon and have the franchise, the energy you're receiving from the business side of things match what you're seeing in terms of what's presented to you. It is different. And honestly, like I, I know Chris, you weren't here for it, but the like I was, I chalked it up to it being as simple as the franchises all being caught to task because the players deserve these things, and it's not like they're asking for something that's just outrageous. Like this is bare minimum that they're asking for in terms of teams having their own facilities, players having their own lockers, the training staffs being up to par, the traveling in terms of charter flights and all of that stuff. Those are basic needs that a, a professional professional especially when it's, the, it's professional like there's some collegiate teams that travel better than professional women's basketball teams that is a that's a problem that is a problem 
you know so like I just don't understand how if if you're truly investing in your franchise and the pieces that ultimately fund what your franchise is able to find an estimation of value and all of those things, you can't be at your best as a franchise if your players are not at their best. And those basic necessities, again, as basic as it gets, you have to have them, period. It's, like you said, players are of the ilk in terms of mindset because of precedent set by – players like Brianna Stewart speaking out um, and ultimately moving in accordance with that uh, teams are not going to go there. If you're not, if you're not up to par, there's a bar, there's a standard being set. And if you're not meeting it, you're going to be outside of the club looking in at everybody else having fun. And it's going to be a little, it's going to be a little treacherous trying to build your way back up there. There are obviously opportunities to do so, but you have to execute upon that plan. It's past just to the point where you're speaking on it. And you're saying all of the stuff that makes sense, and you're saying things that sound good to people. You got to put plan to action and start seeing things happen and coming to fruition. Without doubt, man. Um, I said this on. Uh, I was talking with James K on the last of the Skyhook, and I was talking about like here's how you consider your workplace. But so many of those things that you said just now are true, and I think it's it's good for the players and the league itself. It's gonna be there's gonna be a reckoning uh, that I've said for a while where. Fans aren't going to have the same access that they had in the past just by virtue of more money being put into the product. So the product being better is going to increase that distance between fans and players. But at that same, with that same coin, you get players who are taken care of the way they want to be. It won't happen overnight. It won't happen in the next five years probably, mm -hmm. but they're looking for it more and I think it's going to be interesting watching fans, you know, so at some point somebody's going to get on, on talk radio. This is my dream. Somebody's going to get on talk radio and say, how could Brian Howard possibly deserve that $2 million contract? And then I'm just going to sit back and smile because Brian Howard will be getting a $2 million a year contract, which will still be low, you know, compared to the, the output, the actual revenue. But as soon as you get fans like, how could they deserve that money? That's when you know your sport has arrived because then they're like, man, if I if I was making $2 million, <laughs> <laughs> when you get the, if I was making $2 million, I would box out Cheyenne Parker for no money. <laughs> That's what we're going to get to. <laughs> and I think if we get there, that's a clear, like, you, like you're getting that, that's a clear and direct sign of, the progress that's being made and uh, kind of as a little bit of a segue, just kind of looking at what happened over the weekend with college women's basketball, mm -hmm. obviously you had the scuffle between LSU and South Carolina in a game that had the attention that felt like a, a whole like a solid percentage of basketball Twitter. And that's a general basketball Twitter, people tuning in and watching and the obvious discourse that stemmed from it. You know, you might not necessarily want it to go some of the directions it's gone, but to just have the discourse and clearly stemming from attention being paid to the product on the floor and not just what players look like and all of that stuff, like the actual basketball and what's going on, what led up to this, who did this. That's where you want things to, to be headed direction wise. And Asia Wilson made sure she was able to comment on how appreciative she was of just seeing so many different opinions and perspectives on things going on on the women's circuit. Mind you, this isn't even the actual national tournament. This was the SEC championship game. This is literally just a conference championship. This wasn't even like the, you know, the March Madness, March Madness. This is the prelude to it. So if that's any sort of a, a, a indicator of where things are heading in terms of March Madness on the women's side, we are in for a histo another historic because last season was definitely historic, but another one that maybe even one-ups that just off of the magnitude, the personalities, the attention, the puzzle pieces all in place. I'm looking forward to it, and women's basketball in general definitely deserves it. And I think if they live up to that again, and then the WNBA picks up where they left off last season and kind of takes the baton as well from the March Madness of this, this year, it's going to be fun to see it play out. Firmly agree. I'm very glad you brought up that SEC tournament because there's so much to talk about both in terms of a potential number three draft pick for the sky that was on the floor in one of those games this weekend. Plus 
Uh, I, I definitely want to go into that that fracas that happened on Sunday and the discourse around it and within it, you know, between Don Staley and Kim Mulkey and what have you. But first, let's get a quick word from our sponsor, CD1 Price Cleaners. Now, Sarah I was talking to in the pre-show, and she is lucky. She doesn't have to do much dry cleaning. But, uh, I mean, uh, seriously, it's lucky because there is nothing more annoying than really having to take out a bunch of suits, ties, jackets, your winter clothes, take them down to the dry cleaner. And you never know how much they're going to charge you. And you never know what the quality is going to be. But that's the good thing about CD Run Price, One Price Cleaners. Low prices, customers save over 30% on their dry cleaning bill by switching to CD One Price Cleaners when they switch from their local dry cleaner, the dry cleaner they've been using. Their, their service is simple and it's transparent. Other cleaners will charge you a different price for every garment and they upcharge you. But at CD One Price Cleaners, they charge you one low price for each garment, even sports jerseys, even sports jerseys, the same low price. And the turnaround is fast. They have your order ready the same day or the next day. You even get text alerts when your order is ready for pickup, which is hard to be. Plus, they offer the same wide variety of services that you think you can only get from your dry cleaner locally. That's dry cleaning, washing and folding your laundry. You can bring it in for them and they'll take care of it for you. Blankets and comforters that's hard to take to the, the laundromat, tailoring and alterations, leather cleaning and area rug cleaning. So you look at that rug that's in the middle of your, your living room right now and it's got all the dust from the winter time. They'll, you bring that in the CD1 price cleaners, they'll clean that up for you too. So again, just like they said, we said at the outset, the sponsor of our show, Visit chdo.cd1, that's O-N-E dot com, link in the description. And from there, you can pick up an in-store coupon or a, a pickup and delivery coupon option online. So I don't know what you're waiting for. I want you to watch the show, but I know you're sitting looking right now at that dress you're trying to bring out to spring formal, any kind of going out this week, this weekend, next weekend in May, April, now that the weather's nice. Steven got his jerseys on the wall. He already took them down. That's why you see him on my hey, Listen, I promise you, I already had them taken there. I take all my jerseys there, actually. If you have to, if pick, you have one to pick one that you're up this weekend, is it the Chris Paul, the D Wade, or, or the um or the Carolina Jordan? For this weekend? Yeah, just just because you know, like this is March Madness began last weekend, but this mm -hmm. is like the, the last weekend of conference tournament selection Sunday, all that. That's tough. Uh, naturally, I'm going to probably just say the North Carolina joint just because it's the actual college jersey. Um, but I think I watched, obviously couldn't watch MJ in, in college, but but I was able to see Chris and Dwayne in college, and that was some, that both had some very fun electric. Um, runs in the college circuit on the national national tournament level prior to their NBA career starting. So it's kind of where my fandom of both of those two players started. And um, looking to see what players on the women's side take that stride in terms of having a little bit of buzz to their names going into the national tournament and then taking that an opportunity on the national stage and making more of a name for themselves and their programs from it. That's the beauty of it. The names that might not be as mainstream as others coming to the limelight and then just running away with it. There's a lot of fun in that. And I think, I think again, that's a way for a, a lot of people to learn more about the W players to come or just the general women's basketball players that deserve way more attention. Most definitely. And the Southeastern Conference, they're, they're the best conference for women's basketball, I think, especially just now that the Pac-12 is, is um, said, said its farewells officially with Sunday's game. Mm -hmm. uh, but the competition level that you have with between Tennessee, still good, South Carolina, obviously the national powerhouse, LSU, who's just gone on a, a nice run since they hired Kim Mulkey, yeah. and then other teams in the conference, Mississippi State, um, Kentucky's a bit down since Ryan Howard graduated, but they're still a solid school. Um, all those schools in that conference can at any time be top 10, top 15, and that was on display, uh, especially in Saturday's semifinal with South Carolina and Tennessee. And that's where we got to look at Ricky Jackson and another possible, you know, Sky, you know, at least Sky player under consideration, Camilo Cardoso. What'd you see in that game? 
Yeah, man. That was uh first of all, what a game. <laughs> that was that <laughs> was so, so game. Come on, man. That was such a high level basketball game. Uh for Tennessee to be down for so much of a portion of it and to just continue to just chop wood incrementally. Keep it solid. Keep it about 10, 12 points. Keep it at 10, 12. Stay within striking distance. Go through South Carolina runs. Go through spurts of their own where they saw just minimum scoring. Ultimately, to come back in the end, take a lead in the fourth quarter, then play it back and forth to the end, have a chance, go up on that second to last possession, and, you know, play the chances from there. And we see Camila Cardoso come through with just one of the one of the craziest March moments in recent memory. And for that to be the you know the first three pointer that she's knocked down career wise, I mean that just speaks to the magnitude of the moment, the trust that Don Staley has, and all the back and forth and intercommunication that led up to that, stemming from that last time out that they were able to take, and just the storytelling that comes with all <laughs> special, special, special. I'm I'm laughing because when I checked it out earlier, I watched um, the fourth quarter of the game, saw the highlights with everybody else, pretty much. I was laughing because today when I looked up prep for today's show, the links were how Tennessee's final defensive possession went so horribly wrong or, you know, how they, how could they leave Camila Cardoso open? Bro, it's Camila Cardoso. <laughs> like, this is the first three she's hit in, her, in all of college. She's not a three point shooter, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think some of that is to Dawn Staley the mystique that she has built around South Carolina in a fairly short amount of time, the trust that she put in her senior star and the ability of her and her coaching staff to drop a play where they were able to put all of that in the Camilla Cardoso's right hand that, you know what that reminded me of? And I know you're going, you're going to remember this. And I know it's going across uh, cultures in terms of women and men's, but it was like that Spurs possession back in the day oh, where they man. kicked out to Tim Duncan uh, <laughs> to tie the game on the Suns. And it's like, you drove and kicked to Tim Duncan for a three, but it's similar, it's similar coach, like similar, um, just similar situations and in, in products. Popovich, Staley, not the same amount of time, but mystique around them and their programs, yep. the culture that they built, the foundation between the Spurs and the Gamecocks, you know, that they have more, the Gamecocks have more personality than the Spurs, did. <laughs> but they are all like one through five. They play for each other. They play hard. They don't back down. And you have Cardoso and Duncan who are paint players under the rim, under the rim players to a degree hitting big threes for their teams in clutch moments. Yeah. And it's the spontaneity that comes with it because, again, you got all of this scouting, all of this game planning, all of this film being watched, all of these tendencies being picked up on. Literally, you know how often some somebody sneezes when they're on the court. It gets, it gets that intricate to know, okay, she likes to lead with her left foot or she likes to go dribble two dribbles to her left before she pulls up all the time. It's that detailed especially in a conference championship, a team you've gone against Lord knows how many times over the regular season, and, you know, I've scouted the entirety of the season, all of that stuff adding up to this moment, and for you to have this spade in your back pocket that was unaccounted for, that all stems from just the head coach knowing a player and being able to instill the trust needed for the player to ultimately go to execute in that specific moment. And it wasn't like she knocked that down and the game was tied. They were down. Like, it was do or die. Either you make it and you win or you lose it. And because of the stature of the team that you are, coming up short of the SEC championship would be a letdown prior to, obviously, the national tournament to come. So to have all of that weight on your shoulders and to not have had the best game that Camilla could have in terms of if she would have confidence going into that last shot, she didn't have her best game by any standard, just knowing the type of player that she is. But for her to be able to come through for a team, like she said, just being able to execute for the team after the shortcomings she had in basically a good portion of that game prior said everything about that moment. Uh, so big kudos to her. I think that says a lot about not just the relationship she has with Don Staley and how great of a coach Don Staley is, contrary to some of the discourse 
that we saw, unfortunately, leading into that game. Um, but Camilla is a baller. She's a hooper with a capital B and a capital H. She mm-hmm. she does it. She does it. She just gets her job. She does it. And, you know, we saw her come through doing something that she's not expected to do to get the win, ultimately. And that's a sign of somebody that's special right there. You said spade in your back pocket, and I know Dawn's not listening to this, but Big Joker would be a good nickname for Camilla Cardoso. That would definitely work for sure. <laughs> somebody, somebody, hey, if you're listening to us, pay us, but, you know, merchandising <laughs> is there. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm curious, uh, uh, before I go on it, what were your thoughts on what you saw from the other side of things with Rakia Jackson? That's. I'm glad you said that because I was going to get into it, and I think – just the highlight from the end where Rakia Jackson had that putback that gave Tennessee the lead after it was tied 71 all. Mm-hmm. She had an excellent second half, um, 12 points in the third quarter after being held to three for the first two, and then scored uh, seven points in the last frame when, like you said, things were rocking back and forth. And just, you know, having watched a uh, few of her games this season and highlights from her career. She's had a very interesting evolution as a ball player. And I was looking up comparisons to uh, Ryan Howard just to see, you know, where she fell fall in that in terms of her, her career progression through college. And Ryan's a better offensive player and a better defensive player. But I thought it was interesting. They're both 6'2", but um, Ryan's listed as a guard and uh, Ricky Jackson's listed as a forward. And you can see it in the way she plays. She gets, she likes to get downhill can go uh, to the left or the right, but really comfortable going to that left hand, going down to the basket, uh, can hit the turnaround jump shot, and has a good series of moves in terms of footwork under the basket that at least allow her to get foul shots. And I thought a lot of that, if not all of it, was on display in the second half of the game on Saturday night. So when the drafts have been developing over the last six, seven months, You've seen players kind of pinball around other than Caitlin Clark, depending on who's going to school, who's going back to school, who's actually coming out for the draft. But Rakia Jackson stayed around that three, four mark because of her skill set. And I thought it's been I thought it's been very interesting in terms of how her three point shot has developed uh, from start her start of college in Mississippi State to now her third year, which was her redshirt sophomore year, COVID sophomore year. She took 70 shots and made 17 of them. This year, she took 71 and made 20. So her shot, you know, it's not all world beating. It's not close to the volume that Ryan Howard took in college and made. And it's she's not going to be shooting threes out of the jump. But if you look at the team that the Sky have built, and if you say, okay, they're going to take Rakia Jackson at number three, you have a player who could – Spend time behind Breezy or Izzy at that forward spot and study some of the players that they have on the roster, Marina and D-Double Diamond Shields, and learn how to play downhill, but also how to utilize what we saw on display this year and in that game, her increased level of gravity to feed other players and get them shots. Assists are a funny thing. I know you um, in your work you look at how gravity affects the floor, especially in the half court. And Rakia had her highest assist per game number this season. And I, when I say assists are a funny thing, players still have to make shots and gravity has to account for the players on the floor, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a good shooter, but then three people have to have their head under the basket, you're not going to get an assist passing them out of the three point line. <laughs> exactly. But, She's getting, she got what, around five assists per game? I think it was 4.6 or 4.9. Mm-hmm. And you still have to be able to be a good passer and somewhat of a playmaker for that to happen. So I think that was very interesting just watching that game and looking at her body of work. Yeah. I think looking at assists as an arbitrary number without context can get, it can be a slippery slope. When you apply the context of, okay, this player, speaking of the, through the lens of Rakia, is a player that, When she has the ball in her hands, she has to process multiple different types of defenses. Sometimes it's um, sometimes it's just helping from different spots on the floor. Sometimes it's an all-out double team. Sometimes it's just them trying to influence her to go to one specific area of the floor when she has the ball in certain spots. Those little things and being able to 
quickly process it and also be able to counter it, whether that be with the move of your own to get yourself in an advantageous position in the score or taking those moves and also being able to shift the defense you're seeing to ultimately facilitate the teammates and create, like you said, off of the gravity that you have as a player. I think assessing a player's ability to pass through that lens is more important than just the number because, like you said, shots are not always going to fall. But if you can generate consistently green shot quality from the attention you're seeing and understand and process how to punish the defenses that you're seeing to ultimately put your teammates and your team in general in its best position to win, that's where the that's where the gold is. That's something that you can continue to develop. And, I mean, if she's showing that on the collegiate circuit, which she quite literally did in that game against South Carolina, and the multitude of coverages that Don Staley was throwing at her, the multitude of matchups that she was throwing at her, I think it's all there. It's all there. I think she had nine assists in that game, if I'm not mistaken, or she had eight assists. Yeah. 22 points. 22, 9, and 8. Yep, nine rebounds and eight assists. And you could quite literally see her getting some of her touches in the mid post on the wing, giving a quick peek over one of her shoulders to see if there was help coming from over the help line, who it was coming from, and where was the defense shifting around that, and then scanning quickly, understanding where the spacing principles are for her team, which teammates would be occupying what spot on the backside of that. And by way of that, whether she got a direct assist for that, or she got her just getting it to somebody that was open and they were able to connect and her getting like a hockey assist, ultimately making the pass that leads to a points for her teammates, uh, like a secondary in a secondarily way. That's the that's the goal right there that I'm speaking to. And she had so many of those instances compiled. And that's a lot of the reasons why they were able to punish South Carolina for the attention and the gravity that she had on outer thirds of the floor by getting it to that backside. Now somebody's able to cut. Somebody's able to get a wide open three point shot, or somebody's able to generate a closeout opportunity, which is an advantage in and of itself, to then attack and then play within from there. And they like their process was processing when they figured out that she wasn't going to be able to get as many of those static touches that she typically likes, where she's able to catch it, turn and face, or play with her back to the basket. They had to get her in movement. We saw as the game progressed versus her standing at the block and being double teamed essentially with some of the help points that they have within their offense, she started getting in movement. And once she got in movement, the defense had to shift. And if she's catching on movement, that's where you can kind of tap into more of her athleticism as well. And we just saw them reap the benefits from that as their process kind of evolved to counter against the coverages and everything that she was seeing. Like I said, they ultimately got the lead late in that game and went back and forth, gave themselves a chance in the end. And, you know, risk, risk kind of went against them at the end. But, you know, they did their job in terms of, navigating themselves back into a game where they were extreme underdogs. That risk reward, I just keep going back to that. Mm -hmm. You got that's the player you leave. That's the player you leave to shoot that shot. And I think you don't want to lose that game because that gives you the chance at a top, say a top four seed in one of the regions in the tournament. But at some point you as a coach, you have to sit back and say, that seemed, uh, to paraphrase the late great Bud Grant, it seemed like the thing to do. If you're going to leave somebody to shoot a three, then, and somebody hits a three, you want it to be Camila Cardoso off, off the window. Uh, just on, on the draft, before we take a, another quick break for, for a sponsor shout out, I keep going back and forth on, you know, who the sky could take in that spot, whether it's Rikia Jackson, whether, you know, are they, are they hoping for Cameron Brink if Cameron Brink decides to leave Stanford for the WNBA or could they, you know, take a reach? Could they take Cardoso that high? Uh, that's what I'm, I keep trying to figure out. Some of that goes into rosters, which we can delve more into on our last segment of the show, but do you feel like there's anything that you would want more of that Rakia Jackson cannot provide at this point? Nope, not for me. And it's just looking at the positional versatility she brings on the offensive side. I know you talked about her sliding in at like that four spot, but mm -hmm. the elephant in the room is the three for this for the Chicago Sky right now. And I feel like um, looking at projections forward in her career, She's skilled enough, and you talked about as well the development with the three-point shot for her and spacing. 
she's skilled enough to where she'll be able to, I think, ultimately be a three or a three, four tweener. And that's something that positional, positionally, the sky could definitely lean more into. Now, obviously, there's going to be a greater demand in terms of spacing for her when it comes to playing on the W level. But I do think through skill development, that's something that she could ultimately get to. And then if you look at on the defensive side of things, I think her versatility kind of screams a little bit even more. She can guard multiple positions and do so effectively and do so with athleticism. And when she's really, really engaged, you can see her truly making an impact on that side of the ball um, and denial and holding positioning and not giving up leverage and being able to slide her feet and contain the drive, being solid in rotations with closeouts and recovers and being early with help. Like she's able to do a lot of those little things that you're going to want from that wing position, which is typically the most athletic player on your roster, unless you have somebody like Asia Wilson. <laughs> so I think that's something that I think that's something that Rikia can certainly check a box off of. And then some, and that's a lot of the reasons why I feel like she's the, she's the prime piece for the Chicago sky to take with that number three pick. Should she be available in the draft when the opportunity comes? We're going to take a quick break, then we come back with roster projections and who else this guy might think about taking at number three and number eight since they're back in the first round of the draft twice, two times over. And let's talk about Coors Light. The summer's coming. You know, just because it's 60, 70 degrees out today doesn't mean it's not going to be 40 degrees out in two days. But the summer is coming. Chicago, the long winter is over and the summer is coming. And when the summer really comes, when it's 90 degrees in July, when the sun is baking off that asphalt, and when you're sitting, watching, uh, or listening to the Sky games this summer, you're going to want to sit back and chill, whether it's the Sky winning, whether it's the Sky taking a loss, whether it's the Sky competing out there. You're going to want to sit back and chill. And there's no better way to chill than with a nice ice-cold Coors Light. Is the drink that I first really, really first kind of kicked into, locked onto back in college, and never been disappointed. You see all the things about the – if the mountains are cold, if the mountains are blue, then the beer is cold. Uh, the cold is the Rockies. You've seen the bullet train going through on your screen. Most recently, was that LL Cool J uh, in the Super Bowl? Was that yeah, the yeah man? <laughs> <That's about laughs> off. I forgot to cue the music. Get out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> the only music uh, LL forgot to cue was "I Need a Girl." That's all he forgot to cue. Oh was man, I still need a girl. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but if you're sitting back chilling, thinking how you need a girl, how LL does not need a girl anymore, he's got all the pick of the girls that he wants, or whether you're, like we said, listening to baseball, softball this summer, whether you're athletics, um, Athletes Unlimited, checking out Izzy Harrison, kick back with a Coors Light. There's so many occasions, whether you're at a party, whether you're, with a friend, whether you're just sitting on the back porch, finished up some yard work, got the radio on, got the TV on, and watching the sun go down, nothing better than an ice cold Coors Light. When the mountains turn blue, it's as cold as the Rockies, and it's always cold lager, cold filtered, and cold packaged for a smoother finish. So when it's time to chill, Coors Light is the beer that I reach for. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash CHGO Dunk. That's CHGO Dunk. Celebrate responsibly, Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. And one more thing we want to take a time to point out, prize picks. Prize picks as things are coming up in the spring. Football season's over, but March Madness is starting, and baseball season's going to be starting up soon, as well as WNBA training camp. And there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. So you want to be able to get in that excitement with prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Steven, I know you know not only what players their skill set provides for them, but what it can provide for you in terms of Bradley Beal over under three and a half threes, Kevin Durant points, Yusuf Nurkic rebounds from your son's coverage, or if we're talking about the sky, you know, Marina Mabry over two and a half threes, over three and a half threes, Dana Evans over eight or, or nine assists. Things that Sky fans, you can pick up this summer with prize picks just by following along not just this show, but by following along stats. You can turn those skills, turn that knowledge into quick, cold, hard cash. And you have the skills to turn just $10 into 1000 with just a few taps. 
Prize Picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like LeBron's favorite Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Prize Picks discount select player projections up to 25% to provide even more value. And for all you elitists out there, Prize Picks now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account this basketball season. I saw that. I saw that. I saw you smiling, man. You know how Apple users are. Of course. <laughs> I've been playing prize picks myself just to make some cash on the side, and it's turned into gold for me. And you always want to, as we're going to say, use responsibly. But go to prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use that code CHGO for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use the code CHGO. So once the WNBA season starts, use prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It is that easy. All right, man. Uh, the number three and the number, number eight pick in the draft. draft. Three, three four, four months, months ago, ago, we wouldn't have even been talking about yeah. this. But with the way that things developed, it's the route the sky had to go, and they were able to get back a good return uh, for the players that they that they uh, sent away. So we've talked about the number three pick, Rakia Jackson, just just for the sake of argument. If say Cameron Brink is available at number three instead of the projected number two. Do you pick her over Rakia Jackson, or do you stay with Rakia? So for all of the reasons that I mentioned prior to our our, um, our break that just passed, where we had to pay the bills, <clears throat> specifically with the, the dynamic of Caitlin, Caitlin Clark electing to hop into the draft um, and join the W, I think that obviously checks off the number one. And I think that checks off who's ultimately going to be the best player out of this draft looking long-term and also who's the best in the draft at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think based off of where she's at now, what we just talked about, we saw in the game against South Carolina, projecting forward and what she could ultimately be with the versatility that she brings on both ends of the floor. The sky having two, both a head coach as well as a general manager and other entities in between those two that are skilled in skill development and understanding what buttons to push with certain types of players to optimize them, as well as the opportunity that the Chicago sky would be able to present in context to her. I think Rakia could legitimately be the second best player in this draft when it's all said and done. All their players get drafted, go through their respective careers in the W. I think that Rakia in, in projecting forward can truly be the second best player in this draft. And I, I just, it just, she has the she has everything that you want in terms of where the W is heading in terms of skill, versatility, playing multiple positions, playing in multiple different styles of play, being able to do multiple things. She can do all of those things, and she has that as a foundation already before she's even touched the W. She gets get her in the right hands and the right system with the right pieces around context wise. I truly think the sky is the limit, no pun intended. And I think no better situation for her draft wise would be than to come to the Chicago Sky as well. And like I said, it was for the sake of argument, but I, I'm in agreement. And thank you for reminding me that she's a wing player, can play that three spot, uh, even though she's listed as a forward. I think it's just the development of that three-point shot, being able to spot up in a pick-and-pop situation and hit the um, the mid-range jump shot going further out, as well as once she gets in you know, one-on-one situations, even one-on-two, just being able to divert the help uh, with a quick look out to the perimeter and then make one or two moves to the basket. I think all of those are within her wheelhouse to develop or just build as time goes on. And the wing is the wing is the position in basketball that you want to play. You you, you want to get to that height uh, for what we're talking about, about 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, and then you have so many options as to what you can make your game with the advent of the three-point shot as a, as a primary offensive weapon. Now, talking about the roster construction, before we get to the number eight pick, looking really at uh, Marina, Dana in the backcourt, kind of maybe rotating with, depending on depending on how Diamond um, looks coming into camp and coming out of camp, as, as well as Kennedy Carter and uh, Kaiser Gondrzyk. And shout out to Sky for picking up Kaiser again, uh, with especially what she's gone through and what her pedigree is in college. I'm happy that she's getting another run with them, and hopefully she sticks on this roster or another. But yeah, Marina Dana in the backcourt, Elizabeth Williams, Izzy, um, Izzy, or Breezy McKayla in the frontcourt. 
And then where does, with with Diamond, Sika, uh, Robin Parks, if she picks up that, that contract, and Lindsey Allen, as well as some of the other players we talked about, where does Rakia fit in that rotation? Does she start? Does she play, you know, 10, 15 minutes a game? Or do things just uh, pick, pick up as things go on? I think projecting forward and that lens, through that lens is going to be tough just because I think maybe the biggest takeaway from our last conversation with, with Teresa Witherspoon is that everything is going to be earned in terms of positions. So uh, everybody has a clean slate coming in. What happened priorly, obviously they're aware in terms of what you can do, what you might not do well as well as you do other things. But in terms of who's going to be in what position, everything's going to be earned. So it's going to be about how well Rikia is able to compete in this context. And she'll obviously have some smoke with players of the veteran ilk, like Diamond DeShields, obviously, Michaela Onyewere, that also bring versatility with more experience to their, to their side of things. Um, so I would be curious to see, I would be curious to see where things go with that. I will ultimately see her starting at that three spot and them just in terms of opportunity, investing in that and really ramping up the skill development because she, she's starting at the three. Now that's kind of changing the look of some of the lineups that you're going to be using, especially in starting and closing particularly. And then you're going to be able to see from that, her development in terms of, okay, what can she do on the W that's translated from college? What hasn't and how to, um, how to develop those things and cultivate them and ultimately optimize her. So I think that's ultimately where she should be at in terms of starting with this team. But I also think that with the number eight pick, I have two things to speak on in regards to options there. And one of which could certainly be a piece that really speaks to where the league is going in terms of being more positionless and being able to have pieces that are versatile, like we talked about with Rakia, and doing multiple things. So we'll come back to that. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Quick shout out to um, everybody watching the show, Daniel Berry Sports Highlights, who clocked in with us early. And my man, Kevin Russell, my old bowling buddy down in Florida, back back and forth between Florida and Chicago when he's not in the courtroom. Good to see you checked in, man. Yeah. You got to tune into the show more often. It's good to have you on. Uh, history of Chicago Sky draft picks, specifically at number three. Uh, our Minty Harrington from Ole Miss and from, sorry, the University of Mississippi, 2007. Uh, not a bad career. Finished up with 14.6 win shares. Uh, and, a, you know, not a not a great game-changing player in the W, but had a good career in the W. Christy Tolliver, who did not make the bulk of her bones playing for the Sky, but obviously a great player to have and a great piece for the Phoenix Mercury on their bench now. And the last number three draft pick uh, that this guy had back in 2011, uh, could you guess? Might be, it might be an easy guess. But mm, it was 2011. 2011. Was that Cheyenne? No, no, she came out in 2015. 15. Oh, okay. I'm way, I'm way too far ahead. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. That was not coming off the top of my head. Made the finals twice with the team. And uh, pretty, pretty much, let's say, pretty much their franchise face. Oh, Courtney. Yeah. I don't know how, it's, you know, it's funny looking at everything that's happened in the last, like, four-year window. It was hard for me to kind of think back way past before all of that happened. <laughs> and step, because Courtney's been with the team, well, she had been with the team for so long. You know, it was just kind of, like, the team's just so different than where she, where she was then versus where she is now and where the franchise was. Wow. Yeah, that was a that was a quick catch me on my catch me on my toes moment right there for sure. <laughs> I know that was that wasn't really fair. That really wasn't that fair. Nah, that's fun. <laughs> I love those. <laughs> Far and away the best number three pick that the Sky sure. have had in their history. Mm -hmm. And again, that's with Christy Tolliver in there. And one, as as always when I when I can, great. Uh, opportunity to praise Pokey Chapman's eye for talent uh, because the players that she was able to get in the first round of the draft uh, from Courtney to uh, Atlanta Della Dunn in 2013 and Cheyenne Parker the year after that and or two years after that in 2015 have all gone on to great careers uh, but also Sky had good luck at number three you know in terms of picking top tier talent and so this would be, I think, the first number three pick that has not been a guard, just according to uh, statistics. 
and I can't argue against Rakia Jackson. Now, I've seen a couple of differing opinions between uh, what I saw from Michael Vogel's mock draft at ESPN and Jack Maloney at CBS, and I think that's where things get a little hairy because you have a draft that, for all of its talent, is not exactly deep at the guard position, and the Sky are in an interesting spot where they have some of those spots that you would think would be filled. But as you said, Teresa Weatherspoon says nothing is set in stone right now. So, um, you know, I see Angel Reese on Michael Vogel's mock draft going to the Minnesota Lynx. And then I don't want to say the name because I'm wondering if it's who you're going to talk about. Uh, But there's like you have Angel Reese in there who kind of fell down the draft board just in terms of people looking at her potential as a player, an offensive threat in the W, considering her game. J.C. Sheldon at Ohio State, who's an interesting prospect. Charisma Osborne, who went through injury, but has always been a very solid backcourt guard, scoring guard at UCLA. And um, Georgia Amor, who teamed up, has teamed up with Elizabeth Kitley at Virginia Tech and has carved out a very nice career for herself, mm-hmm. is you know, kind of on the fringes of that conversation really just because she's 5'6". I mm-hmm. think that's the only reason, because she is a, what what people call a cold-blooded shooter. So yep. I think any of those could be up there, but I think when you're doing this rebuild, you're not only looking for a franchise face, which you get at number three, you're looking for somebody who can help you build towards the future, or at the very least, get two, three good years in there so you could put them in a package later if you want to bring a free um, a one or two year deal back for a like big time player. So I'm interested to see who you're thinking about this guy taking your number eight. Yeah, for sure. And like one last thing real quick, just on the context of the Chicago sky in regards to Rakia. I don't think the Tennessee Vols for as solid as their system and their process is on offense. They don't have a player that's going to garner two to the ball attention with gravity and attention from defense, the likes of a Marina Mabry is going to. So if you got Marina going off a handoff or going and pick and roll on one side of the floor and you got Rakia space to the backside, she's going to be enabled an advantage to play off of. And that's something that's unique for her because she hasn't had an opportunity to that extent to play off of advantage except from someone else. Additionally, somebody like Dana Evans, they can get a paint touch even better than Rakia can. There's nobody else on the Vols that's going to get a paint touch as well as Rakia. She is the hub of the offense in multiple respects in regards to garnering attention from a defense and getting the defense in rotation. So you put her in the context of that to where she's not having all attention, all eyes always on Rakia. She can play off of the attention garnered by two other players in two different types of contexts. That makes things different. That also speeds up, like I talked about, that's the skill development part of things that speeds up so much for her. So – I'm projecting for it. I would look forward to seeing her in the sky context and for all the thing, all of the things that they can provide for her on offense as well as on the defensive side of things, being coached by somebody like Teresa Weatherspoon, who's sure to get the most out of her for sure. Uh, but kind of looking forward to at the number eight pick for the sky. Uh, the, the first name that comes to mind for me is Alyssa Peely. I knew it. I knew it. That's why I didn't say it. Man, listen. You can you see a lot of the stuff talking about the positives and the negatives and all of that stuff. I talked about it with Michaela Onyewere, who is a player of the same ilk in terms of how she was spoken on. The skill is undeniable, but trying to put someone into a box in terms of a position ultimately is something that she saw work against her going into when she was drafted. And now look and what I was able to talk to her about, uh, was it three weeks ago now? Just talking about how positionless basketball is playing to her favor versus how it did when she was getting drafted. And she spoke to how, obviously, that's a a complete yes, and how, you know, having more skilled players is advantageous for teams. Alyssa Pili is a player, plays a game completely different than Michaela does, but it's in that same type of realm in terms of you can't put her in a position. She's a hooper, capital H, again. She impacts the game. I mean, offensively, there's literally nothing she can't do. She can run, pick, and roll. She can post up. She can post up bigger players. She can post up smaller players. She is just a matchup problem. She can space the floor, pay off of closeouts. She can play in isolation. 
She can play off of movement. She can be a hub for your offense, playing off of handoffs, making passes. Out of all the contexts that she can operate in, she's a three-level scorer. She gets to the free throw line. She grabs offensive rebounds. <laughs> she's just such a do-it-all type of player on the offensive side of the ball. And I think all of those all of those points that she hits on offensively in her process individually all will translate well to the W. Now, obviously, you'll have to figure out how to feature her within lineups in terms of who she's surrounded by to insulate her for the size discrepancy and how she gets away with things on the collegiate level that she wants on the W level. But ultimately, you have a piece like that that's you can move all over the chessboard offensively. She plays center sometimes, meaning, yeah. for example, she played South Carolina earlier this season in uh in one of the invitational tournaments. They didn't win that game, but her stamp oh, okay. was all over it. She had 37 points, and they put, her, again, they put her at the five, and naturally you put her at the five. What's that doing? That's pulling away one of the best players in the country, best rim protectors in the country, Camila Cardoso. She has to come out and guard her on the perimeter. That's opening up opportunities for Alyssa to play make to her teammates underneath the basket without that premier rim protection that they typically will have. But that's also enabling her an advantage because Camilla's not going to be able to keep up with her in space, especially with the movement that Utah uses Alyssa in. So just looking at her and the puzzle piece that, and the chess piece that she could be for the sky within the sky context of what they need, I think she would be a home run to have at number eight if she's available. And I think, I just think Teresa Witherspoon would would be able to do great things in terms of optimizing the usage out of her within the context of everything that she has on the roster at the moment. Uh, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on Alyssa, and then I had one more other player that I wanted to speak on that you kind of mentioned already as well. I'm looking at Alyssa Pilly's Wikipedia page, and I want to draft her for this next sentence alone. <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> Pilly won 13 state titles across all sports at A.J. Diamond High School in Anchorage, Alaska, including four in volleyball, four in shot put, two in discus, and one in wrestling. Now, I, I know I just put that sentence out there because I want y'all to just really absorb that. 13 state titles. You know, a lot of those are team-based. Volleyball is team-based. Even track and field is team-based. But shot put and discus, those are things you're doing as an individual. And those are things that require strength, you know. And you athletic. You. Yep. Oh, my goodness, yes. And wrestling, especially. Mm -hmm. For not only the fact that she was a girl on the wrestling team, but wrestling requires so much strength, stamina, and athleticism. All the I don't know if people really understand, yeah. Mm -hmm. But she played football as a lineman from third to eighth grade as the only girl in her league and started playing organized basketball at age eight. These are the... These are the things that you want out of a an, an athlete, a, a ball player on your team that I think Teresa Weatherspoon, even though they come from wildly different backgrounds, would be able to understand from the first day that Alyssa Pilly walked in the gym. If not for that alone, <laughs> she, as you said, is a scorer. And this is not, this is not a I am bigger than everybody else, so I'm just getting those shots underneath the rim that um you see from players from time to time, she plays outside in as well as inside out. And this is on the Utah team who she basically made a contender in the Pac-12. Yeah, I can't dispute that at all. When you're coming in at 6'2 with that size, uh, the ability to shoot the rock and the uh, the strength to get rebounds when you need them. Plus, I I want to be clear about when I'm saying this. If you've kicked it with uh, Samoan or Polynesian folks, you understand that they will ride for you until the time is over, mm -hmm. but you do not get on their bad side. <laughs> That's a player you want. That's a player you want, absolutely need. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. I mean that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with that. I'm with that draft pick. You talk, about, you talk about, again, drafting and just generally compiling a roster that exudes a lot of the attributes and characteristics that a head coach has. Again, Teresa Ridlespoon, a winner. One of the first words you think about outside of toughness and grit and leadership, she's a winner. She was a winner. She continues to be a winner in all contexts and walks of life of basketball that she's tapped in with so far. Alyssa Pilly, the one sentence you mentioned, with each specific sport that she's played in, 
The consistent thing is athleticism, competing, and winning, and winning at the highest level. Those are things you can't teach. That shows that you are just able to get the job done. <laughs> and for her, checking off four or five different boxes within doing so, come on, man. Come on. So, yeah. If not for just the tangible skills and the things that you can see optically, the intangibles that come in addition to that, those are things that jump off in terms of when you're doing, looking at a draft board. Okay, this player averages this many points. This player averaged that many points, but the systems were different. But this player has these qualities, these intangibles that are all in alignment with everything we're trying to establish in terms of a culture. Talk about the sky transitioning into a new rendition. Those those qualities that you just talked about, I think those things could be of high value, potentially even of higher value than she can bring on the court with both of those things kind of playing back and forth off of each other, just making for the perfect type of piece to have within your culture. So identity-wise, I think she fits with everything the sky would be looking for. I would love to see her drafted at that eight pick, and she would, again, like I said, be a home run if she's available for them there. But the other piece I would like to get to kind of quickly is we're over the hour mark for the podcast at this point. This great basketball conversation, though. Hey, we gotta have it. Exactly. We just transitioned from two capital D dogs in Rakia and Alyssa. Another one you already kind of scratched the surface on, Georgia Amor. Uh-huh. Obviously, putting drafting a guard is going to kind of have a different type of connotation that comes with it, given everything – uh, currently going on with Dana and trying to figure out what her future is with the franchise. Are you going to keep her when, when she's coming off her rookie deal? Is she going to be extended? What's going to be her role going into this upcoming season? All of that stuff is going to kind of see an uptick in terms of the discourse if you do go ultimately draft a guard like Georgia Amor is. But again, just raising the level of competition in the room, having somebody like Lindsey Allen already on the roster that both of those players will be able to learn from. There's versatility that comes with Georgia Amor as well. And there's just a certain level of capital D dog, not unlike Dana has, that she has. And again, those things in addition to the shooting and the movement shooting that she's able to get into and how she's able to quickly process the defenses that she's seeing and all of that stuff. I think she has a lot of skills and qualities as a leader and as a lead guard that all translate and will translate well to the W circuit. And those are just things you have to consider. So I think Georgia Amor, without going too deep on the on the subject, I think is another piece that would certainly make sense for the sky if she was available at the number eight pick, and if obviously Alyssa wasn't. Um, but there's definitely options for the sky there, and I think there should be some solace from fans in terms of starting to see with Kaitlyn Clark coming into the draft how things are going to kind of align in terms of optionality within the draft for the sky at number three and number eight, and they could be set up extremely well going forward. I like what you said about Georgia Amore, not just her shooting, but her on-the-move shooting, her movement shooting, uh, which every team needs, and the Sky fans have seen in terms of, with Ali Quigley yep. and, and even with Dana Evans in these last few years. Like like we said, the one the one um, hindrance for Georgia is that she's shorter than, than many of the guards that she'd be facing in the league. Mm-hmm. So you'd have to figure out a way to use her defensively in some lineups, but – I think that, you know, something that everybody forgets about small guards is that they have an easier time getting you, getting into um, into the chest of people and making things tough for them in terms of dribbling and moving. So she's going to be, she would have the chance to get a lot of steals and be disruptive at the perimeter if she, especially if she was in that Teresa Weatherspoon system. So a lot of good options, or there's definitely good options for this guy, as you said, in number eight. I think just... After reading, after reading that high school stuff, man, <laughs> it has got to be my top. But I remember watching a Georgia Amor um, package in uh, last year's tournament, and I was very impressed by what she was able to do. And in the same way I talked about Samoans, Polynesians, I think you see a different type of grit with a lot of Australian players that come in. And it's hard nosed, is was one way to put it, scrappy, dogged. And but that's that ability to sometimes be uh, an irritant too. You're seeing with a lot of Australian players, Joe Ingles comes to mind. Even Lauren Jackson had a very in-your-face type mm-hmm. style mm-hmm. Um, that would benefit this team. That you know would not have will not have any shortage 
a player is willing to get down in the mud with you next year. But if you add more players to that who are also skilled basketball players, I think it's a benefit to the squad. Coming to the end of the show, shout out to Brand C. Um, did you already talk about y'all favorite draft prospects? We did, but we went over a few of them just a few minutes ago. And check out the show replay. It will be available on YouTube and wherever YouTube products are sold. Uh, so don't worry about coming in late. We got all the coverage there for you. Uh, before we check out, we want to give it give it up for our Chicago diehards. <clears throat> March 26th, we'll have a Blackhawks takeover CHGO Sports World at the United Center. There's two tickets left for that, and MLB opening weekend is coming up, so we'll be hosting our CHGO White Sox home opener at Ballpark Club on 35th and the away home opener for the Chicago Cubs at the Country Club. Head over to your events page at allchgo.com for all upcoming events and all details, and go natural diehards podcasts and live shows we have them on every chicago team every single day post game shows for the top teams premium written content for members at allchgo.com you can check out steven's work there every single time 20 percent off of events dope merchandise for all teams we got that chgo collection if you have not seen it oh you are missing out that chgo cta t-shirt is a thing of beauty so y'all need to iron that enough, for sure for sure um, I picked one up immediately. <laughs> um, I appreciate when you become a member and the members only Discord, the CHGO Lounge. Chop it up with our editor in chief, Kevin Kaduck, Adam Hogue, Mark Carmen, the guys on the Bear staff, my man Herb Lawrence, friend of the show, Vinny Duber, and Sean on the White Sox team. Every single, you might see us in there when the sky season starts heating up. So there's nothing stopping you from becoming a CHGO diehard. Do it now, do it right now, do it today because otherwise you might miss out. John, do we have last thing? You know what? If John Hosey, do you have any Cinderella's in the upcoming NCAA tournament? We'll give you 10 seconds, John. Steven, you got any Cinderella's? That's a tough question. Uh, I, I would let naturally kind of put my eye to somebody like, like Utah with Alyssa, just because of how she has that takeover ability and how she does so in all phases of the game to where it really weighs down on an opponent on both sides of the floor. So I can see somebody like Utah catching some heat and her going on a two-week streak like she's more than capable of, that could up, upset a lot of different teams that might ultimately be in their way once the brackets come out and see what their positioning is. I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to say USC uh, coming off the ah. heels of winning the final Pac-12 championship. They're probably going to be a two-seed. Uh, yeah. But given the star power that is on that one-seed line, I think that USC would – you could consider them a Cinderella if they go all the way to the championship. That's going to do it for the CHEO Sky Show today. We thank you for tuning in with us. Our man, Joseph Spath, is with the golden hands behind the boards. Shout out to Super Sarah Victor for getting us started. And shout out to everybody everywhere who is with CHEO Sports on the All City Sports Network, sponsored by CD1 Price Cleaners, chgo.cd1.com to pick up those coupons. Until next time, folks, be good, do great things, and never give up, never surrender. <laughs> Y'all silly like